All right, guys, how's it going? It's been another bad week at Intel. And in this video, I will cover the reasons for that, going over why the tech community is having a bit of a meltdown. And on top of that, I'll be taking a look at Threadripper and Epic and analyzing what it all means. So this could end up a long video. Before I get started on all the new stuff, let's have a quick recap of the current CPU situation. We'll start off with Intel. The way they segment the market is, you've got all your i3, i5, i7s, all on your Z270. The basic desktop platform is comprised of all those CPUs, stuff like the 7700K, which would be considered the highest end one, that's your i7, and your i5-7600K. So this is all based on the newest architecture, which was Skylake, and then kind of rebranded into Kaby Lake, which is basically just Skylake on a slightly tweaked process for higher clock speeds. So that's actually their most advanced CPUs, coming in between two and four cores, and also, of course, eight threads with the i7-7700K. Now, after the desktop segment is their high-end desktop segment, comprising of their Broadwell eCPUs. At the top, you've got the 6950X, which is 10 cores, You've got the 8-core 6900K in there, and then two 6-core i7s, the 6850K and the 6800K. Once again, based on their Broadwell E architecture, which is actually their previous desktop architecture. So that's how Intel does it. The new architecture goes to the desktop first of all, and then generally speaking, a year later or so, moves on to their high-end desktop. The same architecture with more cores. So that covers everything between 2 and 10 cores. Intel, of course, has even higher core count CPUs. Again, based on Broadwell, and of course, these are their Xeon branded server CPUs, which as of today, the fastest they have is the 24 core Xeon E7 8894v4. That really rolls off the tongue, that one. Coming in at only $9,000. That's not $9,000 per server. That is $9,000 per CPU. And here we can see 2.4 gigahertz with an all-core turbo of 2.8 and a one-core turbo of 3.4 gigahertz. In the server market, this one-core stuff is not really that important. Servers are, of course, all about throughput. Basically, how fast you can get all those cores and TDP or performance per watt is, of course, also very, very important. So that was just a summary of Intel's current CPU lineup. Now moving on to AMD, whose CPUs are a bit fresher in the memory. They've just got over the disaster that was Bulldozer and are currently in the middle of the Ryzen releases. They started off with the Ryzen 7 series, eight cores, 16 threads, which went into direct competition with Intel's Broadwell 6900K CPUs. That was very much win some, lose some, but there did appear to be an issue with Ryzen's gaming performance. From the start, I said that this was not a CPU problem. It was an optimization problem. And over the past two months or so, I think that's been proven. There's no reason to believe that Ryzen can't be very close to Intel in gaming. But then they launched R5s, with the 1600X and R5 1600 in particular being very popular with gamers for their six cores and 12 threads at the same price point as Intel's four core i5s. They also had a quad core there, the R5 1500X, and there's a 1400 as well. Neither of these CPUs really impressed me, but they are certainly better than an i3 and pretty much on par with Intel's non-K i5s. So like I said, AMD's in the middle of this, they're getting rid of all of their old bulldozer architecture CPUs, and we'll soon see R3s and APUs are coming as well and those look very nice. But what was much more interesting was something I had predicted about a year and a half ago in my Future is Zen video, where I said that there really wasn't anything stopping AMD from releasing a 16-core CPU on the desktop as well. And it wasn't long after the initial rise in reviews, before we started hearing rumors of an X399 platform, AMD's own high-end desktop platform to compete squarely with Intel's. AMD's new 16-core 32-thread Threadripper coming in to battle squarely with Broadwell E. 16 cores versus 10 cores looks like a bit of a foregone conclusion. If you've been following this so far, you will of course know that. It's not quite that simple. Broadwell E was launched a year ago, and like I said, about one year after launching on the desktop or mobile, to generally update their high-end desktop CPUs to the same architecture. So Broadwell is on the way out, and we soon caught wind of Skylake X. 
as you can see here, between six cores and 10 cores. So that was pretty disappointing as it was simply the same as the current Broadwell E core count. In addition to that, we also got KB Lake on the high-end desktop platform. Only four cores though. Immediately, people looked at this and said, Intel, what the hell are you doing? KB Lake X at four cores and only up to 16 PCIe lanes? This was clearly the same KB Lake CPUs we have on the desktop. And on the slide, we can see that it's a 112 watt CPU, which is well up on the 91 watts of the desktop KB Lake i7s. A bit later, we discovered that, yes, the CPUs do have 100 megahertz more, but they also come without the integrated graphics, as you might expect on an X series platform. None of these Intel high-end desktop CPUs come with integrated graphics. But this was clearly going to be a major issue, especially for motherboard guys who were told that all KB Lake X and all Skylake X CPUs must work on all X299 motherboards. Now, I don't want to go into the details of motherboard manufacturing, but stuff like PCIe lanes can make a massive difference to the cost of a motherboard. And we can quite clearly see here that Skylake X has up to 44 lanes, while KB Lake was stuck at up to 16 lanes. That's because the KB Lake CPUs were only designed with 16 PCIe lanes. And there are even more issues because KB Lake's memory controller is only capable of dual channel or single channel mode, whereas the high-end desktop CPUs are capable of quad channel. So all this together is adding a little bit of a nightmare for the motherboard guys and is going to lead to a massive amount of confusion. But even with that, you might think that's not a huge problem. It's only between 4 and 10 cores anyway, right? Wrong. After Ryzen released, Intel decided to update their high-end desktop count to 12. My guess here is that they probably felt that the 10 core options were simply not good enough value in the face of Ryzen. I mean, there are actually cases where the Ryzen 7 1800X with its 8 cores and 16 threads is almost a match for the 10 core Broadwell E which is a $1,700 CPU. So again, another 10 core high-end desktop CPU? There is simply no way that anybody would buy that. So Intel decided that 12 cores would be the new limit on the high-end desktop. Isn't competition just great? But then a couple of weeks ago, at AMD's Financial Analyst Day, we saw something very, very interesting and something that has changed the CPU landscape forever. When Ryzen 7 launched, one thing in particular wasn't that highly discussed, and that was just how efficient Ryzen was compared to the Intel CPUs. And in almost every case, in performance per watt, Ryzen 7 was well ahead of Broadwell E, core for core. So after that, I was sort of looking for one thing in particular. And two or three weeks ago, during Mark Papermaster's presentation, like I said, at AMD's 2017 Financial Analyst Day, one slide in particular caught my eye, and it was this one. Infinity Data Fabric delivers near-perfect scalability. Now, this one kind of went under the radar as well. And in actual fact, it's really talking about Epic, AMD's server CPU. But what this shows is that AMD is capable of scaling almost perfectly, all the way from 16 cores up to 64 cores. Now, that simply means that if a 16-core CPU scores 1,000 points in something, then the 32-core CPU should score 2,000, and the 64 should score 4,000, that kind of thing. This, of course, assumes that clock speeds remain consistent. Now, this is a pretty difficult thing to do because, obviously, the more cores you have, the more difficult maintaining those clock speeds is. You remember going back to the Xeon, the E78894 V4, a massive 24 cores, but only capable of 2.8 gigahertz on all of them. And that is the turbo, so there will be some loads where it actually falls down below 2.8 and maybe even closer to the 2.4. And all of that is in a 165 watt package, which is actually very, very impressive. But make no mistake about it, these Xeons, this one in particular, is incredibly rare. This here is the very best silicon that Intel can manufacture. That's why it costs $9,000. And at 24 cores, it must be an absolutely massive die. I got information that the 10 core Broadwell E was around 250 square millimeters. So a 24 core CPU on the same architecture, with more than double the cache, cannot be all that far away from 500 square millimeters. CPUs of this size are not very manufacturable and CPUs of this size able to maintain these kind of frequencies are very, very rare indeed. So that's how all this works. 
Here we can see a die shot of a 20 core Intel CPU. I believe it's 20 cores, however, two of the cores are clearly a lot different from the rest. Not entirely sure what that's all about. But if you imagine, all of these 20 cores, in order for them to pass a certain standard of CPU, every single one of those cores needs to be capable of it. So if you had 19 cores, let's say 19 of these cores could do 3 GHz, but the other one could only do 2.4 GHz, then this could never be a 20 core. 3 GHz CPU. This last core would let the whole thing down. In a case like that, what Intel would do, fuse off this core and another and sell it as a 3 GHz 18 core CPU. But there's more to it than that, some are lower power as well. So looking at this, you should be able to see that this 24 core Broadwell, you might even be talking 1 in a thousand CPUs. I simply don't know. But there's not going to be many of them this good. So what's the relevance here? Well, the relevance here is Every one of these CPUs is comprised of the same Ryzen 7 die. Ryzen 7 is around 200 square millimeters. So these 16 core CPUs would actually comprise of two of those eight core CPUs. And obviously the 32 core CPU would comprise of four. Once you get to 48 and 64 cores, you're now talking two sockets. In other words, two CPUs on the one motherboard. And how AMD is able to do this is due to their Infinity Fabric, which in a nutshell is the interconnect between the cores on both the CPU itself and between CPUs. I've already shown the Ryzen 7 die shot a few times. We can quite clearly see both core complexes, each comprising of four cores. In an eight core CPU, the Infinity Fabric ties those cores together. And in a 16 core CPU, for example, like Threadripper, which as you can see here is a massive CPU, the Infinity Fabric ties those together at the same speed. It's almost like two CPUs acting as one. And right here, in this shot of the EPIC package, you can see four. Four of what is effectively Ryzen 7 CPUs all tied together through the Infinity Fabric, effectively acting as one CPU. Now, those of you who have been following my channel for a while have almost certainly seen my master plan videos, which was very much focused on graphics. But now we can see that the master plan was really all about CPUs all along. But AMD claiming near perfect scalability is all well and good. You should never trust a marketing slide from anyone. Demos, on the other hand, I do tend to trust. And last week at Computex, we finally got our first real demo of Threadripper. 16 cores running Blender. And here it is. So let's jump in. So this is Blender. And you may remember that image. That's the Ryzen processor that we unveiled in December um, and, and rendered uh, eight cores and 16 threads. You see upper, in the upper right-hand corner a massive amount of threads there in the Windows uh, Task Manager. You see 32 threads. So let's run the render. I'm going to have to talk fast because this thing is so incredibly fast that this render completes in a matter of seconds. So immediately, it peaks all, all 32 threads and just an incredible amount of horsepower running the latest br Blender app. 13.04 seconds to complete the render. Now, this is actually running a different version from the version they used previously when demoing the Ryzen 7 CPUs. This is version 2.78C, whereas the previous version was 2.78A. But I downloaded 2.78C. You can do that as well. Blender is free and open source. On my 1800X and 3.2 gigahertz memory, the render completed in 24.24 seconds. Now, it's not quite perfect scaling. Had it been perfect scaling, then Threadripper would have finished in 12.12 seconds. So this makes me think that Threadripper, the 16 cores, 32 threads, the highest end one at least, may be running around 3.5 gigahertz compared to 3.6 gigahertz of the 1800X. Now, there's a couple of reasons for doing this. 1800X is a 95 watt CPU, and it does draw a bit more power than that due to XFR running 3.7 GHz on all cores. As a high-end desktop platform, X399 and Threadripper do use a bit more power. Rumors have suggested around 150 watts or so. Now, the Threadripper CPUs will be higher quality, at least in terms of performance per watt, compared to the Ryzen 7, probably even the 1800Xs which are, of course, the pick of the desktop CPUs. But remember, on the desktop, we are basically getting the worst silicon possible. And then the high-end desktop silicon should be better. Unless, of course, it's KB Lake X you're talking about. And then finally, the server CPUs are easily the pick of the bunch, as discussed. So what we could be seeing here is the highest-end Threadripper 
3.5 gigahertz, good quality silicon coming in around 150 watts TDP, 16 threads at 3.5 gigahertz, exhibiting almost perfect scalability compared to the Ryzen 7s. Now we know that Ryzen 7 scores over 1600 points in Cinebench R15, so we can reasonably expect Threadripper to score over 3000, or at least pretty close to 3000. And last week again we saw a demo of a 4.5 GHz overclocked i9-7900X, that's the 10 core Skylake X, overclocked to 4.5 GHz, and it only scored 2419 points in Cinebench R15. Looking at that, it should be patently clear that the 10 core Intel CPU has no chance of getting even close to Threadripper, and if the 12 core CPU does 4.5 GHz, it might get close, but this 10 core CPU is already $1000, and i9-7920X, Intel hopes to command $1200 for that one. It's just not going to be good enough, there is simply no way that Intel can win this fight with their 12 cores against 16 cores. And they know it, because at Computex, Intel announced that Skylake X, previously designed for 6, 8 and 10 core CPUs, recently upgraded only to 12 cores, will now also be available in 14, 16 and 18 cores. In other words, these monster dies, huge chips that Intel was saving for the data center, they have now been forced to offer on the high-end desktop platform as well. But does it even matter? Now let's take a look at the Xeon E7-8867 V4. This is of course Broadwell E, with 18 cores and an all-core turbo of 2.8 GHz. 18 cores, 2.8 GHz, and 165 watts of TDP. 18 cores at 2.8 GHz? Now let's just run that one through a calculator. For Broadwell, we're going to assume around about equal IPC. So 18 cores multiplied by 2.8 would give you a total of 50.4. Threadripper, 16 multiplied by 3.5, 56. So that's still Threadripper around 10% ahead. And the Xeon currently sells for $4,672. This is the best 18 core CPU that Intel can manufacture. And they can command $4,500 for that. Now looking at this slide from Intel, they only intend to charge $2,000 for the Skylake i9-7980XE. Again, 18 cores, 36 threads, and it will pretty much be the same clock speeds, or more likely, they're going to be forced to run it up to 200 watts, simply in order to beat Threadripper. And before I continue, let's be clear here. Over at ASUS, one of their guys made the claim that the 18 core CPUs are not scheduled until next year, so they won't have them for a while. This was edited to say that they are not scheduled until later this year, but they still won't have them for a while. So Intel, in complete disarray and panic, are announcing 18 core CPUs, because let's be frank here, they know that their 16 core CPU cannot defeat Threadripper, so they are forced to sell these high-end, extremely expensive server CPUs on the high-end desktop, and there is simply no guarantee that they will be able to beat Threadripper anyway. The X299 platform, from 4 cores all the way up to 18 cores, different memory setups, different numbers of PCIe lanes, nothing but a confusing, panic-ridden mess. And it's all for nothing anyway. You already saw the Threadripper CPU package, there's the Epic CPU package, and while Epic is 4 cores, Threadripper is only 2. But the socket is pretty much the same. One or two differences, but there is literally nothing preventing AMD from selling 32 cores, or 24 cores, on the desktop. And think about this, because a CPU like the R5-1600, 6 cores, 12 threads, a 3.2 GHz base clock, and a 3.6 turbo, with a 65 watts TDP. Even this bog standard Ryzen 5 1600, all AMD really needs to do here is get this down to 50 watts, which can be done by simply using better silicon, easily done, or simply drop this base clock down to 3 GHz. 24 cores of $220 worth of CPU. So effectively you're talking less than $1,000 worth of CPUs. Easily, easily faster than the 18 core Skylake X, which Intel believes they were charging $2,000 for. And if you remember what I talked about, all those cores, they all need to hit that speed. Every Ryzen 7 that isn't dead is capable of running 3 GHz on 6 cores. All of them. Yields must be near 100%. And most importantly, 
it's here now. This isn't about the future. Skylake X is the future, probably six months away. The master plan is here now. Threadripper, when it gets released, will easily be the fastest desktop CPU. I mean, yeah, sure, it's gonna lose in gaming. Obviously, the six core Skylake is gonna be the fastest gaming CPU, maybe. If it can overclock as well as the 7700K can, then that one should be the fastest CPU. But this is not about gaming. Nobody really is buying these CPUs for gaming. And if they were, they're not gaming at 1080p, which is the only resolution that CPUs actually matter at. And in actual fact, would probably be gaming at 4K. At which point, the lack of PCIe lanes is likely to be a barrier towards full GPU performance. We are talking extremely high-end stuff, and the fact is, these high-end desktop CPUs, they really are much more about throughput. So that's Threadripper, and it will not lose to anything Intel currently has, or anything coming really soon. In servers, it's just gonna get worse. We don't have details on clock speeds, but based on what we can see with Ryzen, eight cores at 3.6 gigahertz and around 100 watts, Threadripper, 16 cores at 3.5 gigahertz, around 150 watts, there is little reason to believe that Epic, with its 32 cores and 64 threads, will not be capable of 3 gigahertz while remaining under 200 watts. Epic is coming later this month, and it will be clearly faster than the Xeon E7 8894v4. If they need to go head to head at 165 watts, they will still be clearly ahead. They've got so many more cores, even 32 cores at 2.4 gigahertz should be more than enough to beat Intel's $9,000 flagship. The Infinity Fabric has made all this possible, and in fact, this has been made possible because AMD had nowhere left to go. Intel can create multiple different dies, huge dies for servers, tiny dies for mobile and the desktop. Each one of these costs hundreds of millions to develop and AMD simply could not afford it. The only thing they could do was start from scratch a clean slate and look at how they could create a CPU that expanded their entire portfolio. And this is a CPU that we first saw as Ryzen 7. And it is the master plan. It is just superior in every way. AMD doesn't need to get 28 working cores at 3 gigahertz. They simply need to get 8 cores at 3 gigahertz on multiple different dies. Much smaller dies, much cheaper to manufacture dies, much higher yielding dies. At the very worst, they are set to make an absolute fortune at Intel's expense. And Intel is really in trouble here. Because unbelievably, and as AMD has been saying from the start, this is only the beginning. The first CPU on a process that was designed for mobile phone chips, remember? That's what Global Foundry's 14 nanometers is. Their first Ryzen CPU has basically defeated years of Intel CPUs. Massive CPU on a high-end process. CPUs that used to sell for almost $9,000. I'll catch you later, guys.